I totally get that Dawn seems to be a type right down to the fact that her name is Dawn. <laughs> what I like take issue with is they paint her as a failure professionally, and therefore it is acceptable to then use her story. At the end of the day, like I don't think the way forward is for us to do essentialism in reverse. You can be a non-white Karen. I think that's also a lesson that we need 100%. to internalize. Yes. Imagine if the racial roles were reversed. If, if a woman of color had written something in a Facebook post and a white writer had taken lines of it and written a story that was getting accolades over it. I can imagine the exact same art, uh, argument being cynically weaponized in the other way. Let's move on to the main event. Because Joe, I really, the, from the second I read Bad Art Friend, there was only one person that I really wanted to talk to about it. And it's you. And it's partly because you are an aspiring writer and because you are the, one of the most petty, <laughs> passive, aggressive people. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and I knew you were going to have thoughts and feelings. So let's let's set it up for the three people uh, in the in the podcast sphere who have not yet read this this article. Who is the bad Who is the bad art friend? So the article is called "Who Is the Bad Art Friend," and it was published in the New York Times Magazine. So it's about two friends. Their names are Sonia Larson. And Don Dorland. So Don Dorland did this thing where she made, a, I think, a non-directed kidney donation to someone, which is, again, very admirable. So this is the situation where you donate your kidney to a complete stranger instead of, you know, normally it's a friend or a family member. This is a program that takes kidneys to someone who obviously needs it for medical purposes. So Dawn does this, and then she proceeds for a variety of reasons to post about this on Facebook. Sonia, her friend Sonia Larson, uh, she recognizes does not, or she, she realizes does not at all like the post. She doesn't engage with the post, so she reaches out to Sonia, and she asks, why exactly haven't you, you know, engaged with this post at all? This, express, this this story is too long. We have to, we have to <laughs> no, summarize no, 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 it. No, well, also, also to be clear, it's a private Facebook group yes. that she posts to. That's like key. Yes. She's not just like yes. broadcasting it to like all of Facebook. It's this like private group of like personal writer friends. Yeah. So they're they're all creatives in what city? Like the West Coast somewhere? No, no it's Boston. all Boston. Oh, Boston. All right. Of course. <laughs> That's the other reason I want to talk to you about this. You're in Boston. Um, so they're in a private writers. They're all writers in a small community in Boston. I think working out of the same like workshop or cafe or something like that. And one of them who gives us directed non-directed kidney writes a post about her act that apparently rubs some folks the wrong way because it seems kind of narcissistic. And it becomes even more narcissistic seeming when she starts reaching out to folks about why they haven't basically patted her on the back for having done this genuinely altruistic thing. Right? Right. She also posts in this private Facebook group a letter that she wrote to the recipient of that kidney explaining the reasons <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> explaining the reasons why she she made the donation she talks at length about how she hadn't had a connection with her family or the the place of her sort of her origin and how this act of kindness to a stranger was very spiritually gratifying now fast forward again there uh, Sonia and a number of their friends haven't reached out to her to, to pat her on the back. And so she she specifically reaches out to Sonia because they're part of the same kind of writers group, writers community here in Boston called Grub Street. And she asks, why haven't you acknowledged this? Sonia is a little bit evasive. It's very confusing. But in the end, Don decides, okay, well, m maybe that she's just not that, that interested. It turns out, though, that Sonia has been writing a story that uses as one of its central con conceits a character who has donated her kidney. And she donates her kidney for purposes that are a, a little bit complicated. And, you know, it, it involves a, a kind of a white savior narrative. And it should I should say, I should mention too, that Sonia Larson is a half Asian, half white writer who in her fiction often explores sort of the space for, for biracial or for half Asian uh, characters to explore sort of the cultural exchange and why exactly 
uh, Asian characters often feel maybe oppressed by a white culture around them. So it turns out that Sonia Larson has written a whole short story about a character who is the <clears throat> recipient of uh, a, a kidney from someone who who resembles the 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 real life person of Don Dorland. So this this kind of reveals a whole slew of of, of questions and and, and interesting. Um, uh, I don't know what I'm saying here. Well, okay, so. <clears throat> The the things th what really makes this kind of go left, and there's some question about who is the real villain here, who is actually the bad art friend, because basically Sonia gaslights Dawn and claims that she didn't really notice the post, wasn't really interested in the post, nothing like that. Then the story comes out, and Dawn feels vindicated, like oh, like you saw it, you didn't say anything about it, but then you basically appropriated my experiences to write this story, which was getting some notice and some accolades, and she got published in some prestigious journal or something, blah, 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 blah. And at that point, Sonia kind of doubles down and says, no, this isn't about you. Later on, it comes out that in an earlier draft, she had literally cribbed direct lines from Dawn's original Facebook post. And it was the publisher that had been like, mm, you got to change this because this is a little problematic, and she did. And all of this comes out because ultimately Sonia decides to sue Dawn and she gets in discovery all of these text messages and communications between Sonia and all of her other friends at this writer's workshop who have all been trash talking Dawn behind her back the whole time. So one, yeah, go ahead, Joe. So, so the, the, the other layer to this, by the way, is that Sonia and all of these writer, writer friends don't have a ton of respect for Don. And while Don's busy sort of involving lawyers, contacting the publishers, they're all saying, why don't you just write your own story? If this is your original sort of narrative, then go ahead and write it. Like we can actually use this as creative material or Sonia can use this as creative material and she shouldn't be penalized for that. That's what writers do. They draw inspiration from the world around them and they shouldn't be vilified or much less sued for, for, for doing that. So like, like what exactly is the issue? And so it, it raises a lot of questions around who has the, who has the freedom to, to tell one's own story, right? And in, in Don's case, she believes that she essentially has been plagiarized and that mm -hmm. there is a, an ethical violation happening because at the very least, Sonia should have alerted Don to the fact that she was using Don's life as inspiration, or actually, what she should have done is not actually written that story at all. I mean, so what? I mean, what do you think? It, it, which one of these broads is the bad art friend? Because the internet seemed to come down very, very strongly in defense of Sonia against Don, and Don was characterized as a kind of Karen, this like white woman who's not self-aware, who needs everybody to like her, who only does altruistic things performatively, like Megan Fox and Machine Gun Kelly. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's just like a bad actor all around. And even, even though it's kind of like gross that people are talking about it behind her back, she basically brought it on herself by assuming all of these people, many of whom are people of color, were actually her friends in the way that sometimes historically white people will over-ascribe friendship when none exist. You know, the polls show that like, if you ask black people how many white friends they have, they're like one. And if you ask white people, they're like 50. And it's, there's obviously a mismatch there as to who thinks who's their friend, you know? So I'm going to answer your question in a pretty circuitous way. And oh, so as, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Buckle your seatbelts, everyone. <laughs> as, as Brie alluded to, I spent a significant period of my life thinking that I could be a short story writer. And I still write on the side for my own kind of personal satisfaction, but I don't do that as a profession anymore. Let me rewind this, this story back to maybe like five or six years ago. So mm -hmm. Bree and I were having a conversation about our families, and she once told me a really poignant, beautiful story about her family visiting her great aunt in North Carolina. Where Virginia. Virginia. <laughs> See, I'm getting all the details wrong. It's potato, potato. Potato, potato. I thought that that was a fascinating kind of kernel of the story. So 
I ended up using that as the kind of germ of a, of a story idea on my end. And I ended up writing maybe, I don't know, 500 to 1,000 words, nothing significant, but I did write something that used Bree's personal familial history as the basis for a short story that I thought had some potential. So I'm going to stop there and ask you, Brianna, does that sort of leave you feeling a certain way? Does that offend you? And I think you 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 know sort of the 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 details of the story that you told me. Yeah, it was about our last visit to go see Aunt Martha, who was very old. She was my father's great aunt. And how when we got into the car to leave her, my parents both kind of broke down and started crying because it was they assumed this might be the last time we saw her. We were living overseas. We only came back every two years, you know, there, it could have been the last time. And that ultimately my father ended up passing away before Aunt Martha, and it's kind of a parable in how you shouldn't count people's days, right? I will throw this story back at you, Joe, because just two months ago, we were on a car trip, <laughs> and you told me an amazing story that was like, mm, it just wrote itself about an aspect of your family. Um, and I said, if you don't write this, Joe, I am going to. So how, how, so, so let me answer, I'll answer your question. It doesn't necessarily, like if you had written something and gotten it published and it helped you in your career, I would be happier for you to have gotten that validation and that like initial push than, you know, than otherwise, like than any kind of sense of lingering resentment. The, I think that the, I, I am someone who also wants to write, right? And thinks of herself as maybe writing a, you know, vaguely biographical sort of novel one day. And so there's a part of me that's like, oh, I would hate to write something truthful about my life that seems not truthful or cribbed because someone else got to it first and published it first. But in terms of just raw, like if I weren't a writer, if I had no interest in writing, I wouldn't care if you took, you know, or borrowed the story. And even, even, even the way it is today, I wouldn't care so much because you know, I have no actual plans to write, and it feels a little bit like our mutual friend squatting on the name Arthur when neither of us is probably going to have any children. <laughs> neither of us should, like, wait to the name. <laughs> um, yeah, but how would you feel if I wrote the the dramatic funeral story of, you know, the Lees that we discussed? No, but what if your best friend weren't Joe Lee? What if I were Joyce Carol Oates? Well, then I would be mad because she's whack. <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is, and this is the issue. <laughs> <laughs> this is, but this is also, I think, a, a, a distinction to draw between you and I and and Sonia and Don, where Don be believed that she and Sonia were closer friends than they actually were. She mm -hmm. assumed a level of intimacy, of closeness that wasn't actually there. And you all should actually read the article because, as part of that discovery process, when it became a, a legal issue, it turned out that. Sonia and a lot of their writer friends were making a lot of fun of Don behind her back over Facebook. And it was it was it was pretty messy and and and, and not very kind. Wait, let's read yeah. some of it. Well, Go ahead, there, there, there might be like a little bit of a class dynamic here as well. Mm -hmm. Like the story, I don't think directly it talks about Larson's background, but Don explicitly comes from like a very poor background, which means that she makes the fatal mistake of believing that it's possible to have real friends in the professional class as opposed to just sort of like <laughs> eating each other. Fair enough. And I think that class dynamic is also an interesting, you know, uh, fact that butts up against like the racial narrative that's been really driving a lot of the online response to this. Um, someone who is hopefully going to be a guest on the show soon, Tressie, uh, soon, Tressie McMillan Cotton, um, tweeted uh, basically very much in favor of Lara, sorry, I keep Larson. The, the, the half Asian woman, um, basically kind of buying into the idea that, you know, you shouldn't have, have assumed this friendship. She said, one more thing about this. Everyone here was bullying, but the group chat communication is not bullying because it was bounded. It is not like the mean girls at your high school because the whole reason those behaviors were destructive is because you could not leave high school. Basically, this was private. Like, it's sure it's hurtful for all of these things to have gotten out, but that's what happens when you depose somebody for the text messages. And like, it's not really on them. It's not really mean girl behavior. Like, do you think that that excuse flies? If you no. say mean things in, in the woods and nobody hears it, does it count? Can you hear it? 
No, because I, I think the the idea that that is actually like in the woods is is false. I think they're all committing these ideas to paper. I mean, I think this is all over like a Facebook grouper or, or, or something more, maybe like an email thread. And, and, and I think like once you like put that out there in a, a group of that kind of a level or something, I, 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 I think you have to assume then that that's going to be part of kind of like the public record around like your friend. So, but here's the difference though. I think if, if Don were a successful writer and like the, the article goes into detail about how while she's had some measure of success, she hasn't been published at the same level as Sonia. And I think that has been part of the reason at least why Don is so infuriated that her story is being co-opted by Sonia because she is someone who has been a frustrated writer. She is Mm -hmm. someone who hasn't achieved the same measure of success that Sonia Larson has. And if she actually had been someone who had had the book deal, who had had other stories published, it probably would have been the case that she wouldn't have gone after after Sonia litigiously. And I and I should say too, by the way, I remember when Swody ended, <laughs> there were there were more than a few people who contacted me privately and said, like, how do you feel about, you know, Brianna, like, you know, moving on to a different podcast? And like, truth be told, I, I swear to God, I was always like, this is this is a feather in my cap too. I'm so proud that Brianna has you know, made all of these professional career advancements. And I, I feel really fortunate to be able to kind of like watch her like do this work. Okay, Don. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I'm the bad art friend. <laughs> I would just no, like to but, say. But again, it's because we're okay. close friends. We're besties. And so it makes sense that I would be happy if you, say if you actually ended up writing a short story using that, family, you know, anecdote that I was telling you about, if you would use that to say, get published in, you know, the New Yorker, I would say good for you. Someone is using this because I've just been sitting on this for for, for years and years and years. However, if this were, you know, someone I hated, oh, sorry, it's someone that I just felt more ambivalent (laughs) towards. I hate a lot of people. So that's not gonna, (laughs) that's just not gonna make a lot of sense. Just jumped. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> then, then I, I, I think I would be similarly furious and, and hurt about that, of course. Okay. I just – okay. Here's my issue. I, I totally get that Dawn seems to be a type right down to the fact that her name is Dawn. <laughs> like, like I, it's very easy to kind of like stereotype Dawn and not have sympathy for Dawn. Like the trope of like a kind of a – white woman of a certain age with a savior complex who thinks she's like really lefty and progressive who gives a kidney for reasons that might be just truly purely altruistic but the way that she's kind of like talking about it seems performative like i totally get why everyone is wanting to be like team sonia but let's just take a second to reflect on the fact that all while Sonia and then we're gaslighting her saying, oh, this has nothing to do with you. This isn't your story. This is just a vague idea. You can't copyright ideas. This is what was going on. Here's a quote from the article. <clears throat> this is after Don, uh, Don sues. The litigation crept along quietly until earlier this year when the discovery phase uncorked something unexpected, a trove of documents that seemed to recast the conflict, the conflict in an entirely new way. There, in black and white, were pages and pages of printed texts and emails between Larson and her writer friends, gossiping about Dorland and deriding everything about her. Not just her claim of being appropriated, but the way she talked publicly about her kidney, uh, uh, but the way she talked publicly about her kidney donation. Quote, I'm now following Don Dorland's kidney post with creepy fascination, Whitney Scarer, a Grub Street co-worker and fellow Chunky Monkey, texted to Larson on October 2015 the day after Larson sent her final draft of The Kindest to the group. That's the name of her story. Dorlin had announced she'd been walking in the Rose uh, Rose Bowl Parade as an ambassador for non-directed organ donations. Quote, I'm thrilled to be part of their public face, Dorlin wrote, throwing a few hashtags. Hashtag do more for each other. Hashtag living kidney donation. 
<laughs> Larson replied, oh my God, right? The whole thing, though I try to ignore it, persists in making me uncomfortable, dot, dot, dot. I just can't help but think she's feeding off the whole thing. Of course, I feel evil saying this and can't really talk with anyone about it. I don't know, Shkara wrote. A hashtag seems to me like a cry for attention. Right, Larson wrote? Hashtag do more for each other? Like, what am I supposed to do? All caps. Donate my organs? <laughs> Among her friends, Larson clearly explained the influence of Dorland's letter. In January 2016, she texted two friends. I think I'm all caps done with the kidney story, but I feel nervous about sitting it out because it literally has sentences that I verbatim grabbed from Dawn's letter on Facebook. I've tried to change it, but I can't seem to. That letter was just too damn good. I'm not sure what to do. Feeling morally compromised slash like a good artist, but a shitty person. But I think that's really telling. She doesn't feel like a morally compromised artist. She feels like a morally compromised person. So she feels bad that on a personal level, she is using Don's letter, but I think letter, but I think professionally, she doesn't see any issue with that. And the 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 article goes into detail about sort of how plagiarism is considered in this field and how something like a, a letter can be used as as inspiration and how she doesn't really view that as as any sort of plagiarism. However, <laughs> however, however. What, what, what I, like, take issue with is they paint her as a failure professionally, and therefore it is acceptable to then use her story. If she had been Joyce Carol Oates, again, your most favorite person. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? She's Joyce, been effing up on the internet recently. <laughs> if Joyce Carol Oates had, had written a letter on Facebook and posted it... <laughs> None of them would have dared to actually use the language of that letter because they viewed her as 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 lesser as not their intellectual equal and as not their professional equal. They felt emboldened to use that as sort of raw content for or sorry, she felt that she could use that letter as raw content for for her essay. And I, and I feel like they were they were punching down and 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 it, it wasn't. It wasn't good. It wasn't good at all. Yeah, I mean, the the irony is, like, the internet was very, Twitter was very united around the idea that, like, this is, like, a white tears issue, that Sonia is a woman of color, hashtag BIPOC, and that she is being victimized by this white woman who's making it all about her. But there is this way that, I mean, Sonia and them explicitly say that they found Dawn's kind of expression of why she donated the kidney and her the way that she was manifesting this perhaps narcissism on Facebook to be such a type, to be such a stereotype of a thing that they didn't perceive it to be plagiarism because it wasn't about her. It was just about what white women be doing, as it were. And I, even though like I have frustrations with Dawn, who was just doing too much throughout this story, I it is uncomfortable for me for the public narrative, the Twitter narrative to be this is like crappy because women of color have to deal with all of these things. But also they are in fact expressly, literally essentializing Dawn and are so unwilling to see Dawn as an individual who like. As a human being. She's a human being. Like she's not just a white woman. Like sure, white, but maybe, maybe this is a type. But I don't know that we would be comfortable with that kind of stereotyping as an excuse for ignoring direct plagiarism of this woman's Facebook post. You know, a, 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 as as a way to like absolve them all uh, morally. Yeah, it no, seems exactly right. backward to me. Right. Well, and also, so just to borrow a critique from the New Yorker, there was an mm. article that came out either today or yesterday by Katie Waldman that said, that argued that like nobody's actually reading the short story itself. Mm. That's kind of at the heart of this, and that it sucks. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and that it sucks because it it does the same thing of just like utterly failing to extend any like empathy or interest in in like the like the evil white character that is being lambasted throughout the story yeah yeah i mean this is a thing that i've obviously talked about in other respects and i don't really i don't want to really open myself up to being accused of like caping for white people again or whatever like i'm tired i'm still like recovering from the whole nazi mishikas but like at the end of the day like i don't think the way forward is for us to do essentialism in reverse I just, I don't think, like, I understand the cathartic value in Joe, you and I, as BIPOCs, 
privately by roll our eyes and say whatever we're going to say about the people in our lives who are like microaggressing us or whatever. But in the big bad world, I just, I don't, if you're going to publicly steal from someone and then want to publicly defend it in a lawsuit, I, at a certain point, you have to acknowledge the other person's humanity. And here, here are two things I will say I learned as a lawyer. Every litigator learns. One, don't write down anything you don't want to see in discovery. <laughs> and that includes your private emails. When I tell you the things that I've seen in people's private emails as I've been doing a discovery review, very personal, private yeah. things. I learned as a paralegal straight out of law school at age 22 that there is a kink <laughs> that involves women wearing heels that make their feet look like horse hooves. I learned, that. <laughs> I learned that through discovery. Okay. <laughs> you you do not you do not want to write down anything you don't want out there. But also like an apology goes a really long way. And if she just hadn't gaslit Dawn, if when Dawn was like, hey, I feel like there's notes of what I said in your story. And she said, you know what? I did see your post. It was such an admirable thing to do. I felt a little conflicted about it because I did feel like there was maybe something a little you know, self-involved about your post. Maybe I was wrong to make that judgment. I apologize. But I created a character that's not you, but based on that instinct I have that there are some people who are like this, even if it's not like you. And I wondered if I might give you an attribution or invite you to like have a joint talk with me about some of your recent work or whatever I can do to properly attribute that you were the inspiration for this story. Would that make you feel better? But to be clear, it's the the letter that you're taking issue because she used Dawn's open letter that she wrote to the recipient of her kidney. Yeah, she posted yeah, yeah. that onto Facebook. But it's not the actual sort of entire sort of uh, inspiration about like the kidney. If it had just been the kidney, no letter, would you feel the same way? Um, a little bit. A little bit, yes. Because the idea, first of all, it's, it's, it's so rare for someone to do one of these non-attributive kidney donations or whatever they're called. So, you know, if, if, if I, if I, Joe, you know, won Guinness Book of World Records for like, you know, growing my nails out the longest in the world, and then you write a story about that the next day and you're like, oh, it's not about you. There's been like 15 other Guinness Record book holders in the history of time. Like, no, some things are so unique and rare that it's obviously about you, even if it's not the literal plagiarized letter. And to, like, gaslight her and pretend like this wasn't at all inspiration for the story, it's like I'm writing, a, oh, I just happened to write a story about a Korean-American family from Sacramento. Like, Joe, why are you getting your panties in a bunch about it? Like, no, that's ridiculous. Yeah, the gaslighting part, that I also found infuriating because she went – months and months and months sort of feigning ignorance about the even knowing about Don's story and knowing about the whole kidney thing and, and and that was pretty reprehensible in my book. So I was able to pull out of my my uh, my drive uh, the first paragraph that I wrote using your life as a story. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> let's hear it. <clears throat> now, listeners, uh, just so you know, this is all from the perspective of a young black girl. <laughs> not, not me. <laughs> Wait a minute. I just want to say, Joe, you have literally never shared with me anything you've ever written, even though I've been begging you for like 15 years. And now you're finally going to share something with me. And it's in the context of this bloody podcast. Oh, because, well, number one, you're a real writer. And so I was always so frightened that I would send you something and you would say, Joe, oh, Joe, been, okay, you're terrible. We'll, and we'll we have can't this be conversation friends anymore. We, we'll, and then, and then okay. number two, like, this is, this, I, I, I reread this a few hours ago and it's not very good. So I just think it's hilarious. But no, okay. but the point is, is I want to, I want to, I want you to sort of gauge how you're feeling as a response to this in relation to the story. Okay. So this is, again, something that I wrote in response to Brianna telling me a personal story about her, herself and her family. When I was seven years old, I went to visit my great aunt for the last time. I was so much older. At that point, she was already 90 or maybe 91. Old enough so that to a young child, she was beyond elderly. She was 
like a monument to the tenacity of human existence, the, the eighth wonder of the ancient world. When she would welcome me and my family, and at that point, that was my three older sisters and my parents, I changed some details. <laughs> Joe, that's she Joe's life. <laughs> she wouldn't exactly get up to greet us. Rather, she'd hold court on the porch of her, her Greek revival home outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. I think this is where it happened. No, Virginia. Sorry, Greek Virginia. Greek revival. Oh, my God. She lived in this, like, tidy little cottage that had a gas – like a like a gas station na- next to it with a snack – like a, sna- a convenience store. And they, they ran the convenience store, Aunt Martha it's did. It's fiction. Okay. All right. Gr- gr- yeah, this, is, this is the most, like, predictable Brie response you could imagine. So, like <laughs> – no, Pedantic, but to me, it's like they're like working class black people in Virginia. They don't this have is the point, revival. though. Greet, okay. Greet, right. Greeting us like the Queen Mother would for, would greet four dignitaries. Not exactly imperious, but certainly not warm. Each time before we got out of the car, my mother would turn to my sisters and me as my father parked the car and would, <laughs> would hiss at us in the way a, a wounded cat might at the prospect of a bath. Ooh, that's a, that's a good, <laughs> good, good metaphor. If you do anything bad, I'm going to spank you so hard. We understood that for her, this was not a social call with a beloved family member. It was a chore to be completed, a burden to be managed until my father has gotten his fill with his aunt. And as we hopped out of the back, my sisters and I would fold our skirts just so and pull up our socks while we whispered variations of vacuum itch. To make one another laugh. Do you remember vacuum itch? No. What is vacuum itch? If you, if, if you mouth vacuum itch to someone, it's it's it looks like f u b. I know. We had somewhat different childhoods. So exactly pulled from my childhood. So, anyways, that would have gone on and on and on and on. And I intentionally did not change it because this is set in North Carolina. I had intentionally, you know said as the central character, a young black girl. How would you have felt? <laughs> okay, so, okay, I, I would have had And this is feelings. Joe. This isn't, this isn't, you know, this Joe Blow you. down the street. This is Joe this Lee, is one of Joe your besties. Lee, one of my besties. Okay, so my concern is that the spirit of the thing, I'm so distracted because one, like, like corporal punishment, like, it just feels like a lie about my family. Like, we didn't do corporal punishment. Like, we we weren't made to dress, like, prim and proper or anything. Like, we were always, like, a well-dressed family, but, like, and not in a gender normy sort of way. We were very quiet, naturally shy, well-behaved kids, so there wasn't any, like, threat or anything. And Aunt Martha, like, she wasn't judging or imperious. She was just, like, an old lady, and Uncle Thurden was old, and they were just old, and it was it was very humble. The things I remember were I was so I was so ensorcelled by the idea that there was like a little gas station kiosk attached to the house with one of those old timey like circle like signs, you know, um, and that we could they would let us like go into the the convenience store and like take what we wanted, and you know they had one of those big glass tables with like the photos under the glass, the coffee tables and everything was all doily and like hadn't been changed since like 1964 and Uncle Thornton had a gun and a violin hanging on the wall and he offered to take the boys out in the fishing boat which I bristled at but didn't say anything about because I was a shy quiet well behaved kid I and wouldn't have wanted to go <laughs> <laughs> I would have been like, aren't there some cookies to bake? Should we do some some needlework in the in the in the living room? <laughs> Yeah, but but also my mom would never have um, – she was always so supportive of, you know, my father having a relationship with his family and would never have been, like, tolerating a visit. And if she did tolerate a visit because she didn't want to be there because it was, like, a family member she didn't get along with, she never would have let us know. She never – she never – she never would have tried to, like, poison our perception of our family member. So this like, is all to say, sorry to interrupt, but this is <laughs> no. this is all to say it feels like a violation, right? Because Yes. <laughs> well, because and, and all, by the way, all you told me was probably four or five sentences about this this portrait of your your family life. And I thought it was so interesting, so resonant that I took it and decided I'm gonna use this to 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 at least give the foundation for a, a much 
longer narrative that was probably going to be wildly different or absolutely wildly yeah. different from yours. But like, just to, to give you all an example of this, it's, it's, it's just when, when your story is co-opted by someone else, it feels fucking awful. And I think that's what's missing from, from this. Yeah. From from the, the, this essay or f- what, what some people are missing, when someone takes your life story or something that's incredibly meaningful and appropriates it, it, it feels like a violation. And, 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 I, and I think on, on, a, on an emotional level, it, um, that should be acknowledged. Yeah. I think that's right. I, I think that's right. On the, on the flip side, though, I will say... I mean, this is a little different because it's still – I have – well, I'll just say what it is. When I took a writing class in law school, you'll recall I used my free uh, eight, eight credits of take anything you want in law school to fully take an undergraduate writing class. <laughs> I wrote about when my parents met uh, based on what my mother had told me about it at, at Howard. And I was a little apprehensive about showing her the story. Because, you know, you know, I, I knew there was some room for me to have gotten it very wrong. Not that she would be upset with me or anything, but, you know, I was you know, curious what she would think about it. It was kind of my first real write, creative writing effort. And her response was, OMG, like, how do you know this? Like, how do you know it was like this? It's just so accurate. And I was like, well, low-key, mom, because you're always talking about it. You know, tell the same story a million times. But, like, also, you know, I obviously filled in stuff. You know, I, I like told a story. It wasn't just like the direct anecdote that she has conveyed to me. And it was very satisfying to hear from her that I had captured the spirit of the thing. And I do think that if you had, you know, if, if a story truly captured the spirit of what I had described, especially if I had no plans to write, like my mom has no plans to like, you know, write a biography or anything, then it would feel perhaps wonderful to have someone really have heard you and understood you and to be able to describe you perhaps better than you could even describe yourself or what had happened to you better than you could describe what had happened to you. But but I think this is interesting. And this dovetails with a conversation that you and I have had about cultural appropriation mm. in, in general. Again, I wasn't going to change the, the protagonist away from a, a, a young black girl because it just made sense from the description that you gave me it, it didn't make sense to transform that into, you know, a young gay Korean, a Korean American guy why? or something. Because that young Korean American guy didn't have an Aunt Martha growing up in Virginia slash North but, Carolina. But Joe, the point of the story was about was about how we sometimes anticipate tragedy. And we never really know what life is going to bring us next. And, and it was it was about this kind of like essential idea of how you don't – you shouldn't count people's years. You shouldn't waste a lot of time being sad about something that hasn't happened yet because you don't really know what's coming down the pike. Unfortunately, you know? though, because of, you know, society and culture, it's a lot harder to write – that personal story than it is to write the story that is much more accessible that has been told a million other times so that it's ingrained in your brain. Like we're all conditioned to be able to write the story of friends. <laughs> I don't know why I came up with that example. <laughs> than we are to write the story about something much more personal because that's the one that society has, has told us no. is much more accessible. So, I mean, I'm not trying to like, I'm not trying to do like, intimate therapy here but i think this is a little Aren't bit of you? a <laughs> this Aren't is a little bit you? of a you this is this is a person this is a little bit of a personal there there is no reason why you couldn't tell a story about you like name an aunt give me one name of one aunt that you have or older relative that you have helen helen there is no reason why you couldn't have written a story about a young korean boy gay or otherwise <laughs> visiting aunt <laughs> visiting aunt helen his his father breaking down in tears as they drove away. Perhaps this is even a more interesting story, his kind of stoic Korean father showing this like breakthrough of emotion because he thinks he's going to see him for the last time. And the mother and father weeping on the front seat of the car and then realizing that it was actually a parent that expired before on him. There's no reason that that, that, that is the spirit of the story, right? It, 
But it's. I'm sorry. I I I I think there's no reason for me to to not have said that, told that story. But the the difference is is that it's easier to tell the story from a particular lens that has been told many many times before, so that. It's one that you are more familiar with. But what is the what is the familiarity? Why is it like more familiar but told many times if it's like a random black family in Virginia versus Korean family in Sacramento or wherever Helen lives? Because I've seen and heard that story many more times than I have like the the I don't wanna, you know, paint with such a broad stroke, but like the the Asian equivalent though. Because well, like those those stories are are are, are not as prevalent. So two things. One, the fact that there's more representation of blacks and like fiction and media and stuff in America because of our like numbers is an argument, I think, for writing it about Asian Americans, not against. Sure. Yes. And second. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And, and second, I, I would maybe float that this is a little bit about not wanting to maybe arguably be intimate with aspects of your own personal life and engage emotionally with those issues and instead. so we're gonna go here <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna go here diane sawyer I'm dr just, phil <laughs> i'm just saying joe because like i've asked you often why you don't like this the story i'm not gonna say it because i genuinely don't want it to get cribbed but the story you told me a couple months ago when we were road tripping to maine was so complete and so beautiful and so exactly emblematic of everything that I've learned about your family dynamic over the last 18 years. It was so perfect. It like it had a beginning, middle, and end. It wrote itself. You told it in the sequence it should be written. It was perfect. You should moth radio hour that shit. Like it was perfect. And you seem to have like no interest in writing about it. Yeah, this is getting real deep. Okay, so I, I have we a don't question. have to talk about this. Sure. No, no, it's fine. But were you silenced or were you silent? <laughs> Joe. <laughs> Joe. Joe. Bree. So I think this is like a bigger conversation that we can have offline about <laughs> what may or may not be keeping you <laughs> from this writing career when all the material is right there. But with respect to Bad Art Friend, I was really, really shocked by how it seemed like the racial dynamics of the people involved seemed to completely absolve the Asian American woman, uh, so Sonia, from um, any, any guilt. I mean, they were so mean. They were so mean. No, 100%. Yes. But the, 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 but the, the last thing, though, is I, I will say, and I'm just going to play devil's advocate, is that this is true of a lot of writers where they think everything is copy. Everything is ripe for inspiration to use in their material, right? And so in, in Sonia's mind, a, a letter that is posted online is perfectly acceptable to be used for, for inspiration for her own but come story. On, that's, that's like facially dumb. It's like, oh, the Declaration of uh, Independence is in a uh, public library, so I'm going to open my story four score and seven years. That's not the Declaration of Independence. But... <laughs> 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 I promise I went to high school. <laughs> okay, you know what I'm saying? Like, there are a lot of public documents. Just because something is public doesn't mean that you can crib it verbatim. That's just insane. Like, why would you? And then the, the 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 excuses that she's coming up with, she's like, it was just so good. It was just so perfect. I tried to change it and couldn't. That to me reads as laziness. That's like laziness as a writer. You're telling yeah. me this is the exact perfect series of words in the world that just can't be recreated. If the words are that special and unique, then you definitely need to give Dawn credit, right? Because yeah, no, she 100%. wrote those words. No, and, and that's the thing about plagiarists and I'm not, necessarily calling Sonia a plagiarist, but what we often see with people who do plagiarize other people's work is that they don't need to. It's entirely mm. lazy. They actually have the skill and the ability to, to write their own creative thoughts. The difference though is that they, out of a sense of entitlement, view the whole world as sort of like open source material that they can just like take from and include in their in their own work, which like 
they don't need to. That, like that's the that's the the most frustrating part of this. Yeah, I, Melania I read, Trump could have written her own speech. She did not need to crib Michelle Obama's. I believe in her. Any hole is a goal. <laughs> Wait, did she actually what? say that? <laughs> Wait, what? Was that a gay meme or was that something that she said? I no, she didn't say that. Never don't mind. Know what you're talking. I do not know what you're talking about. <laughs> Sorry. No, I I just I just like ejaculated something that I got just from it. like from like just some it. like gay meme. Any hole is a goal. We gotta cut that, Ben. <laughs> cut. <laughs> Wait, I'm googling it. Oh no, it's someone on maybe Drag Race. I'm drag seeing race. a drag queen yeah, dresses sorry. Melania who is saying it in a meme. Yes. So, so almost. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's the same thing. <laughs> That's the name of the episode now, by the way. It's, it's the same thing. <laughs> no, any hole is a goal. Oh. <laughs> okay. I, I just, I just want to, I do want to read a little bit more from this because it's just part of why this story went viral is because it, it was very compellingly laid out. Um, it was just um, juicy. Uh, the the tea was hot. Okay, so here, here, here's the thing that got to me. At a certain point, arguably. It's Sonia who is acting like the Karen. And I don't really hear people saying this. I'm not saying that Dawn isn't a Karen, but Karen's abound. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. Um, this is again to the, 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 dep- the deposition, the deposition um, text. By the way, I know that you have a dog in this fight, Joe, because you like Celeste Ng so much. And she was in the text thread with Sonia and them. No, she's a big defender of Sonia. Agreed. Yes. Yeah. Who's a big deal writer. What's the book that you told me to read that she wrote that I liked? You didn't, but like I had, little, I had little, mixed. you didn't like Little Fires Everywhere, did you? No, that I didn't read that. I mean, I watched it. Um, it's <laughs> you, you had me read the one where there was like the Asian professor who like cheated on his wife with a white student. Everything I never told you. Everything, Everything I, never I never told, told you. you. Yes, that's Celesting. So yeah. she was part of the same group of writers in this Grub Street kind of like writer's workshop who were in this thread. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. That summer when Dorland emailed Larson with her complaints, Larson was updating the Chunky Monkeys regularly. Chunky Monkeys is the name of the little group. And they were encouraging her to stand her ground. Quote, this is all very excruciating, Larson wrote on July 18th, 2016. I feel like I am becoming the protagonist in my own story. I mean, Larson's a pill. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, come on, like, how is that any more or less uh, caring than anything that uh, Dor- Don Dorland ever said? Oh, I feel like I'm becoming a, pro- a protagonist in my own story. She wants something from me, something that she can show to a lot of people, and I'm not giving it. You can be a non-white Karen. I think that's also a lesson that we need 100%. to internalize. Yes. A hundred percent. Okay. Maybe she was too busy waving from her floating thing at the Macy's Day Parade, wrote Jennifer DeLeon, instead of, you know, writing and stuff. P-I-T-C-H. <laughs> Others were more nuanced. <laughs> Quote, it's totally okay for Dawn to be upset, Celeste Ng wrote. And to her credit, she was a more reasonable one. But it doesn't mean that Sonia did anything wrong or that she's responsible for fixing Dawn's hurt feelings. That is just some friend management is what that is. That's when you know your friend is effed up, but you're just trying to be a good friend and like splitting the difference. No, exactly. Like, I'm not going to apologize to my friend for throwing a drink in your face, but I'm going to say that like that drink was, wasn't very tasty. <laughs> there's, there's some good, there's some good TikTok memes about this that we should put in there where they're like, you know, um, girl, I had to like, we break up with him. Yeah, girl, you can do what you want. And so I went to his house and I slashed his tire. He deserved it, girl. And then I poured kerosene all over his baby's carriage. Well, <laughs> you had a sexy carriage, you know? <laughs> We're trying to figure it out. Okay, that's that's what Celeste feels like she's doing. Like she like she knows she knows that Larson yeah. was wrong. But I always say that about you. If you were if you <laughs> called me, me, if you called me and you were like I killed a man. I'd be like, well, I'm going to get a zip car because I don't own a car. And we're going to go to Home Depot. We're going to get the shovels and the bags. And we're going to take care of this. Okay, like, but that's because you're a real one. I'm just saying that you shouldn't say that on this podcast or in any text threads because <laughs> it's discoverable. Discoverable. <laughs> okay, look. So here goes. Okay. Uh, I can understand the anxiety, Larson replied. 
I just think she's trying to control something that she doesn't have the ability or right to control. Literally her own words. I, yeah, come on. Quote, the first draft of the story really was a takedown of Dawn, wasn't it? Calvin Hinnick wrote. But Sonia didn't publish that draft. She created a new, better story that used Dawn's Facebook messages as initial inspiration. But that was about a lot of big things instead of being about the small thing of taking down Dawn Dorland. Like, they're literally talking about taking down Dawn, Dawn Dorland. On August 15th, 2016, a day before telling Dorland and Brianna Joy Gray's 31st birthday, <laughs> I thought... <laughs> I value our relationship, uh, Larson wrote in a chat with Allison Murphy. Dude, I could write pages and pages more about Dawn, or at least about this particular narcissistic dynamic, especially as it relates to race. The woman is a gold mine. Later on, Larson was even more emboldened. Quote, if she tries to come after me, I will all caps fight back, she wrote Murphy in 2017. Murphy suggested renaming the story Kindly Dawn, prompting Larson to reply, all caps, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> like I'm sorry when you if you read the Twitter discourse none of this and I, again I really I could spend as much time talking about how awful Dawn seems but that's already been done on the internet just the full on discourse like am I wrong Ben like the full on discourse was like not only is Dawn just a white Karen and bad but like it is also inappropriate of Dawn to have even raised this claim because the Lawson story was really actually not even about the kidney transplant, but about these other racial aspects of the story that honestly escaped me because the whole discourse well, that, is about Dawn. <laughs> I mean, like that's because Twitter consists of mostly just like various versions of Sonia Larson, like <laughs> cool girls with like, you know, ambitions who want to be like on the inside. Well, one person who isn't that is Jesse Single, who I did notice had a take where he put the photographs of Don Dorland and Sonia Larson side by side and asked basically which one of these people is actually white, which I sent to you, Joe. And I was like, I'm not entirely on board with this framing either. <laughs> the idea being that like Sonia, who's Hoppe, doesn't look so Asian that she can lay claim to any discrimination or any of the concerns about the racial aspects of her story being downplayed in favor of the drama about Don. Yeah. Let me read you some of Jesse's, let me read you Jesse's tweets. And I hope to have, I mean, I know some of you are going to feel some kind of way about it, um, but I hope, I hope to have Jesse on the show um, to talk about myriad other things. Um, one underappreciated subplot about Dorland v. Larson, someone just pointed out to me, is the idea that one participant is white and the other is a person of color, who the white person may have therefore oppressed. I mean, he writes, and then has their pictures side by side. He says from New York Times Magazine, quote, there is very little emphasis on what this must be like for Sonia, said Celeste, and what it's like for writers of color generally to write a story and then be told by a white writer, actually, you owe that to me. And then again, post their pictures side by side. Now, I think there is a way that this, the, the racial dynamics here are being kind of like overly played without denying that um, Sonia is Asian enough to make a racial claim. I think that she can be fully Asian and the most Asian looking person on the planet. And I could disagree with the substance of the argument, but not because of how Asian she looks. I definitely think it's being overplayed and not because of how Asian Sonia Larson looks. And truth be told, I actually don't know what she looks like. I purposely did not like look up how Asian she looks. Well, let me show I you. Don't... <laughs> because you don't want... No, because I actually, well, I, I listened to the, 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 I listened to the audible recording of the article and I didn't, <laughs> I didn't actually read it. So it didn't. Oh, there you go. Ben's on the job. Wow. That's interesting. In this black and white photo to the left is Sonia. That's Don. Oh, sorry, it's Don. Yeah. And this one over on the, this one too, with the color. That's the one Jesse put next to the. Well, I think that's immaterial. I, I mean, that that's the, the one that Jesse put up is is uh, a victim of probably unflattering lighting that makes her look a no. certain way. But you know, like we we have no idea the sort of you know context that she Sonia Larson grew up in and the sort of discrimination that she experienced or the uncertainty that she experienced as as someone who was Hapa kind of navigating both worlds. I'm going to read you I'm going to read you the way the racial aspect was framed in the article. Yes. 
Like Don Dorland, Sonia Larson understands life as an outsider. The daughter of a Chinese-American mother and white father, she was brought up in a predominantly white middle-class enclave in Minnesota, where being mixed race sometimes confused her. Quote, it took me a while to realize the things I was teased about were intertwined with my race, she told me over the phone from Somerville, where she lived with her husband and baby daughter. Her dark hair, her slight build, in a short story called Gabe... Dove, which was picked for the 2017 edition of Best American Short Stories, Larson's protagonist is a second-generation Asian-American woman named Chun Tao, who is used to men putting their fingers around her wrist and remarking on how narrow it is, almost as if she were a toy doll, a plaything. That's never happened to me. <laughs> um, what, um, while Chun Tao is the story of a flawed hero, wait, don't do that, blah, blah, blah. Um, the study of the hidden motives of privileged white people comes naturally to Larson. Quote, when you're mixed race, as I am, people have a way of confiding in you, she once told an interviewer. What they say, often about race, can be at odds with how they really feel. In The Kindest, Chun Tao sees through Rose from the start. She knows what Rose wants, to be a white savior, and she won't give it to her. So she's the kindest bitch on the planet, she says to her husband. By the end, we may no longer feel a need to change Chun Tao. As one critic in the literary journal Plowshares wrote when the story was published in 2017, quote, something has got to be, um, so, sorry, something has got to be admired about someone who returns from the brink of death unchanged, steadfast in their imperfections. Okay, so after some of the litigation, this happens. Here was a new argument for sure. Larson was accusing Dorlin of perverting the true meaning of the story, making it all about her and not race and privilege. Larson's friend, Celeste Ng, agrees. Larson was accusing Dorlin of perverting the true meaning of the story, making it all about her and not race and privilege. Larson's friend, Celeste Ng, agrees, at least in part, that the conflict seemed racially coded. Quote, there is very little emphasis on what this must be like for Sonia Ng, told me, and what it is like for writers of color generally to write a story and then be told by a white writer, actually, you owe that to me. But Ng also says this wasn't just about race. It was about art and friendship. Ng told me that Larson's entire community believed that Dorlin needed to be stopped in her tracks to keep an unreasonable writer from co-opting another writer's work on account of just a few stray sentences and destroying that writer's reputation in the process. This is not someone I am particularly fond of because she has been harassing my friend and a fellow writer. So we were all quite exercised, I will say. Imagine if the racial roles were reversed. If, if a woman of color had written something in a Facebook post and a white writer had taken lines of it and written a story that was getting accolades over it, I can imagine the exact same article, uh, argument being cynically weaponized in the other way. No? No, uh, like a hundred percent. And I, and I think, I, I think we can probably agree that Sonia Larson's argument about sort of like uh, about like like weaponizing race in this situation like like doesn't like hold any merit because like in the end like we're privy to the internal conversations that happened between Sonia and all of the writer friends that actually didn't have anything to do with with race or 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 Don or Sonia's sort of you know like interactions when it came to race but like what it kind of came down to was they were in support of like the more powerful friend like in that relationship, like Sonia Larson was the one who actually had already had like the like the book deals, who had already like secured all these relationships, who had had like the more like pedigreed kind of like for professional trajectory, whereas you know like Don Dorland like did not, and so like they were like throwing their weight behind her over um, over Don, and so like I, like yeah, it like the there's a, there's an over reliance on on the, the racial component that like doesn't make sense. And like, to your point, if like the racial dynamics were reversed, it doesn't really hold any water. Yeah. I, I will say that there was an excellent tweet from friend of the show, uh, Dr. Stephen Thrasher, who was on last fall and will be on again shortly from a text, Scarlett Johansson and Emma Stone competing to play <laughs> Larson in the movie. <laughs> And on that note, hey, YouTube, don't forget this is a podcast to get full episodes, including ones that are behind a paywall. Go to patreon.com slash bad faith podcast to get more episodes. Please do subscribe to this channel, hit the notification bell and like this video. Bye.